spoken before about how we live in a world of illusion, a world of externals, and how one of the paradigm shifts that you need to accomplish in yeshiva is reality. Not to look at the surface, not to look at the illusions, but to look at what's really below the surface, what's really true. Our very illustrious guest, and we're so honored and pleased to have him, if all you know about him is what you read in the media, and there is plenty to read in the media, so you're not getting the full picture. I mean, we're not going to um, belabor the tremendous accomplishments, of course, the most recent, that not everybody thinks it's an accomplishment, but Jews were very, very proud, at least most Jews. The fact that he was invited by the president at the inauguration. And he travels the world representing the Jewish people in ways that are really both authentically Jewish and very compelling. Rabbi Heyer from scratch built the largest dues-paying Jewish organization in the world. That's 400,000, if I'm not mistaken, 400,000 actual dues-paying members of the Holocaust Museum. What he has shown, and this was a chiddish, because there was a sense that, look, the Orthodox, what we do is we have to worry about the religion, about the, the rituals, the shuls, mikvahs, maybe day schools, but the real representation of Jewish values and Jewish agenda, that has to be left to the conservative and reform. And Rabbi Heyer has proven that to be not only false, but counterproductive. When we think today about who are the real supporters of Israel, who are the real supporters of Jew authentic Jewish education, who are the supporters of authentic Jewish values and Jewish priorities, Rabbi Heyer certainly rises to the top. I believe that Newsweek called him the most influential rabbi in America at some point. I'm not sure that that's changed, but the, of course they have to sell magazines every year, so every year it has to change. A trailblazer of Jewish involvement, promoting Jewish values everywhere. That's all on the surface, and it's all true, and it's all commendable. But we have to go below the surface, and we have to appreciate and realize that the foundation of all of that is Torah. Torah and Torah values. Somebody said, I hope I hire you, I won't be, you won't be able to identify who said it because I heard it from more than one person. In essence, Rabbi Heyer is still that yeshiva student who is rooted in Torah. He's out there in the world, but the foundation is Torah. And that is what you have to appreciate, that below the surface, the success is Torah. I'm not sure if Rabbi Heyer realizes that part of the success of this yeshiva is because of the Torah he came to Los Angeles to build. He first came to Los Angeles and he set up a Balchuvi yeshiva which fed us some of our best students back in the early 80s. That was, since then, Rabbi Heyer, of course, took those Torah values and became worldwide impact. And if there's any lesson before I turn it over to Rabbi Heyer for you guys to learn, is that you have to think, as we said, the Sloan Rebbe's Yetzir Hara is katnus hadas, little small-mindedness. You have to appreciate there's huge responsibilities, huge potential, and Rabbi Heyer can certainly serve as a role model for all of you that you can have major impact in many different directions. We're very honored to have Rabbi Heyer with you. benefactor of this yeshiva, I knew him very, very well, I knew the whole family. And <clears throat> basically I want you to know that a long time ago, I sat where you sat for many years. I never went to, you, I'm, not, I'm not boasting about this, I never went to university, graduated high school, learned six years in the Vesemedrish, Yaakov Yosef, 
when I learned from Smicha, I learned to cross the street and I wouldn't stop your mom in. There I discussed to meet and become very friendly with Rabbi Yankov Safsel. If you read the biography of Rabbi Aaron Kotla, you see that the Slobodka Rosh Yeshiva, when he had to rank his three Talmidim, he said the three outstanding Talmidim ever learned in Slobodka, that's a big challenge. Everybody learned in Slobodka, it was pretty good. So he ranked three. One of them was Nifta and the Shoah. The other two was Rabbi Aaron Kotla and Rabbi Yankov Safsul, the Visky Ibu. Rabbi Yankov Safsul knew Shas the way we would say Ashrei. <laughs> and he never looked in an Ashra. How do I know that? This I'll tell you before I'm going to talk on another subject. I'll tell you how I know. <clears throat> the rumor spread the Yeshiva. And so one day I picked up a Shagasarya and I asked him the Shagasarya's Kasha. Famous Shagasarya. Shagasarya's Kasha is on. The, the Gemara says, Loma Kodma Shma Loim Shemoa. The Gemara says, because Shma's Kabolas O Malchus Shemayim Loim Shemoya, Kabolas O Mitzvos. But the Shitas Rashi, Rashi holds that we are only the half does a derisa. And the Oyim Shemoa is not a derisa. So according to Shitas Rashi, he says, very stark, Akasha the Shagasarya. What does the Mishnah have to say? Because this one is Kabbalah's own Machah Shemayim, and that one is Kabbalah's own Mitzvah. Give a much better answer. The Hafta is the Raisa. Lohim Shemayim is the Rabbana. I asked that Kasha to Rabbi Yankov Saf. He never told me it was the Shagasari's Kasha. What he did tell me is, in very strong Litvisha language, I should write down my address. I wrote down my address and he misspelled it. I said Moshe Haya. He, he wrote Mush, M S H Haya. And he wrote me some 48 letters. And those 48 letters were sent to me over a period of six years. While I was in Vancouver, kept receiving. I, he sent it to my parents. They, when I would come, they would give me a letter. Nobody could recognize handwriting. Mom is impossible. I showed it to many gedolim. They looked at it and they, they said it would take them months to try to figure out every single word. He wrote it like Ashrei, but it is the way, it's the way it was. So I had there at the Schusser meeting, of course, Rabbi Yankov Sassel, as I told you. Since I spoke Yiddish, my Rebbe, the Rosh Hashiva Rabbeinu Kravitz, the Rav Aaron Kotler said a shir once a year in Yankov Yosef. And he needed Bochum to pick him up, but the Bochum had to speak Yiddish. In our class, there were very few people who spoke fluent Yiddish. I did. So he dubbed Ringwald and myself. He had the car and I spoke Yiddish. So he picked up Rav Aaron. And one time, he carried a Mishnah Barura. That was another word. Rav Aaron always read with a Mishnah Barura. So one time, he said, in the back of the car, he, he said to me, must be tailed Eden. Why did they, why did they, why did they, must be tailed Eden, Pasha, Mishala? No, he said, must be tailed Eden, Pasha, because he said, not tailed Eden, Pasha, Mishala. He said, why do you have to count Jews first time, Pasha, because he saw, they got out of Egypt, Pasha, Mishala. That would have been the right time to count Jews. Why do you wait for Pasha, because he saw? He's doing, he said, Without Mishpotim and Truma, you're not Jewish. That's why. Uh, so I, I give you that introduction to show you I also learned the same seats you're in for many years. <clears throat> now I want to talk to the I want to give you a more worldly look. <clears throat> and Rosh Hashanah, second day Rosh Hashanah, the parish is the Akeda. <clears throat> Before, in the parish of the Akeda, you have one of the most underrated psukim 
in all of Tanakh. In my opinion, it's a five-star Pasuk. And if you ask me, uh, what, what does the yeshiva world think of this Pasuk? I'd say they give it one star. It's, it's not considered, uh, not very important. But in the 21st century, it's critical. Vayares amokom. What? Mirah. It didn't say Mikoro. It said Mirah. Now, why would it say Mirah? <clears throat> because God is not located in local zip codes only. So if your zip code for Borough Park, I don't know what it is, but I know my zip code, 90035. And the problem is that many people today have forgotten that the Borough Shore doesn't live in local neighborhoods only. Of course he lives in Borough Park. Of course he lives in Bnei Brak, Yerushalayim. I'll get it. But he also lives in far places. And we don't think so. In places we never heard of. He said, far away the mountains. They were not near at all. And why do I begin with this puzzle? Because I want to tell you how we conclude the Akeda. This is from Rabbi Yosheh Ben Salvechik one of the most brilliant comments that you could possibly find, if you think about it. I'll, let, I'll, I'll, I'll let, tell you the kasha and I'll tell you the story. His problem with the Pusik is, problem with, the, with this parasha is, the mafta shouldn't be there. It's not relevant to the, to the Akeda. On the second day of Rosh Hashanah, you know how we end the relating. Here's how we end the lane. And after these monumental things of the arcade on top of the mountain, that belongs near, near the sacred parish of the Akeda, that we should read this and Rosh Hashanah and conclude like that. Find another place for this, for this afterthought. And Rav Salvechik says, it's the main part of the Akeda. Why? Avrom Avinu brought Yitzhak to the Akeda. A Malach interfered, and the Malach said, Avrom Avinu was willing to sacrifice Yitzhak. And the Malach interfered and told him, no. And he says, no. He says, what did that parasha teach you? that the Jews are going to have in their history a lot of sacrifices. The Akedas are forewarning for other Akedas, positions, pogroms, the Shoah. There, there wasn't one period in Jewish history where we were free of Akedas against the Jewish people. So Rav Salvechik says, tell me, when was the real kiyum of the Akedah? On top of the mountain or on bottom of the mountain? Most people say on top of the mountain. No, he says. The kiyum of the Akedah, that's why you have Vayahi. When something starts with Vayahi, Vayahi Achrei Advorim and then there's the other key word, that's your code. The other word is Hine. Wherever the word hine is, take a second look. That's what that part, that's what it means. So since the, look out, 
Vayi achrei advor meila vayugad vayugad lavrom leima hine yolda milka gamhi. The Rav Salvechik says, tell me, why all the Jews are suffering all the Akedas? God, can you tell me what's going on in the Goyesha world? Ah, it's a professional legend. You want to know what's going on in the Goyish world? Perfect normalcy. No sorrows. This one gave birth to this. The other one gave birth to that. There's no mention of a pogrom. Nobody was taken. To, nobody is, is accusing them that they're locked in areas. They don't want to tolerate Jews. There's resolutions in the United Nations. 87% of all the General Assembly resolutions were against the State of Israel. No, by the Goyim, he says, by not Jews, perfect normalcy. So the Rabboni Shalom says, Tavlom Avinu, on top of the mountain you had great Tisoyeris, and that you saw, and you, you said to me that you're an Evet of the Rabboni Shalom. When you came to the bottom of the mountain and you saw that by the Goyim gave all his goods, and you still feel the same way of Avinu. That, he says, was the key of the, of, of the, of, of the Akeda. That after he came down on the bottom of the mountain and he saw this only happens to Jews, he still was committed to the, to the Bris of Rome, still understood that the Jews have a special mission, and that was the main part of the, of, of the, of the Akeda. Where is the relevance today? So, People think, you see, by the Akeda, the Rabbana Shalom appeared on top of the Vino. He never appears unto us. 21st century, who saw it? Yeah, in Pearl Park, you go to a river, go to a great Russian Shiva, they'll tell they feel, they feel, but nobody has seen him. By Aris Avokam and Rocho, we don't have that privilege. It's because we don't have a good optometry. If we had a good optometrist, we'd see him. How do we know that we see him? So let, let's take one event. Don't accuse me of being a Zionist because I am. I don't apologize for it. But I want to tell you something. <clears throat> so let me show you how. What's the shot? Why Yaz You all know in 1917. The Balfour Declaration was issued. And it was issued, Lord Balfour, he issued the Balfour Declaration, says the Jewish people have a right to a homeland in Palestine. Now, at the same time that the Balfour Declaration was issued, more or less the same week, two people met each other 350 miles away. <laughs> They were fighting for the United States Armed Forces in World War I. Their names? Eddie Jacobson, Ayid. And the other name, Harry S. Truman. They met each other in the same week of the Balfour Declaration issue. They liked each other. And they went into business. They opened the haberdashery store in Missouri. Now, what happened? July 20th, 1944, Adolf Hitler, there's an attempt on the life of Adolf Hitler, Yamach Shemov Zichro. The attempt fails, but Hitler is wounded. And nine out of ten Jews don't know this fact. It was the last time that Adolf Hitler ever spoke in public even though the, 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 the war was another year. He never again spoke in public. Why? His advisors told him they're going to try again. Don't speak. No public addresses. Not in Berlin, not anywhere else. Stay in the Hague. On the same date, <clears throat> July 20th, 1944, Harry Truman, I mean, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is nominated for a fourth term as President of the United States, but he doesn't come to the convention. He's in San Diego. And he has to deliver for security reasons during the war. He delivered his speech from a train in San Francisco 
piped into the convention. On that night, the vice president, so they nominate Roosevelt, he delivers his speech from San Diego, the whole oil of May goes like that. Then there's an uproar in the convention. The whole uproar of the convention is Wallace for vice president. Who is Wallace? He's the sitting vice president. They want to re-elect him. And the whole thing breaks out in the hall. Now, unbeknown to everyone sitting in the hall in Chicago, the convention chairman made a deal with the press that he's going to kill all nominations for the vice president because they don't have enough press to cover it. So he won't allow it to take place that night. So Wallace's people are going up to the convention thing and they're saying we want to nominate the Wallace. And the guy, the, the convention chairman goes, Convention is closed for tonight. Nominations for pre vice president take place tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, the first ballot, Wallace wins. By 290 votes, but not enough to be vice president. You have to have another election, another vote. On the second ballot, for mysterious reasons, all the other delegations suddenly go to Harry Truman. Truman is elected vice president of the United States. Eight hours before he was elected vice president of the United States, Roosevelt cardiologist informs Roosevelt and the senior aides the maximum he can live is another year. He will not live more than a year. As a result, Harry Truman not only became vice president of the United States, but according to the cardiologists, very fast going to become take over for a Roosevelt, who won't live out a year. Now comes the most remarkable. Truman doesn't know anything about foreign affairs. Shumdava, he knows domestic. So he relies on George Marshall. George Marshall is a very strict favorite. He loves oil and loves the Arabs. Now, time passes. Roosevelt dies. Truman is now president of the United States. But he still relies on Marshall. And Marshall says, nothing doing with the Jews. Can't give him a state. Because if you give him a state, you lose all of the Arab oil. In comes that heat from Missouri, Eddie Jacobson, without an appointment, on March the 13th, 1945, rushes into the Oval Office to see his former partner. Says, Harry, your, your hero is Andrew Jackson. Chaim Weizmann came all the way from London. He's very sick, sitting in the wall of a story in New York, and you don't want to see him. How could you do that to the Jewish people? And Truman tries everything to fight with him. Jacobson doesn't give in. And Jacobson says to him, you, you have your hero, he's my hero, and look what happened to the Jewish people in the Holocaust. How could you do this? And Truman says to him, I'm not in the base Spanish. I can't quote anywhere near. He uses curse words on it. And he says, OK. Tell him to come in. And he comes in. He arrives from New York. And Truman tells Chaim Weizmann the biggest secret in the whole world. And he said, I just that my partner made the case. He says, don't tell anyone. When a state of Israel is declared, I promise you that I will immediately recognize it. The Kachavit. And by the way, March 13th, which was a Shabbos, and I, I don't condone Chil Shabbos, not for Chil Shabbos, March 13, 1945, if you looked it up, what Parsha do you think they read in shuls around the world? Parsha's Truma for Truman. <laughs> <laughs> it was Truman's time to give Truma. 
And the end result was that a Jewish state was recognized. Remember, it started November 2nd, the same week of November 2nd, 1970. Truman first meets Eddie Jacobson. They like each other, they become partners. And when the moment in history comes, it all comes together. Uh, you know what I say about that? I say that the shot in that interpretation is Fayar es habokum mehochoik. And you have to be able to see that the Rabboni Shalom is not only in Borough Park and he's not only here in Yerushalayim. The Rabboni Shalom is in the White House. He's even in North Korea with that Meshuggah. <laughs> It's, it, 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 people think, oh, we have their bone show, he's the only in our place. Everywhere else, he's not. It's not true at all. Melech Malchel Mochit. If you don't believe me, look at the Ramban. Look up this Ramban. What does the Ramban say? And a remarkable Ramban. The Ramban writes, Velach Echod Goza Al Mamono Vial Gufenu Umelech Acha Merache at the same time that one king is after our physical bodies and after our material wealth, you'll always find in history another king who will have who will be Merachem, and then the Ramban adds these magic words. Vizel Remez, this Bohoya Machna Nishal of Leta is the interpretation I just gave you. Vizel Remez Lidoros. This is how you have to learn history. You cannot learn history like, you know, oh yeah, history with Achashvero Shinesta, but nothing to do with our time. In our time, where do you find the Rabbanishal of? In certain neighborhoods with good zip codes. That's not true. The Ramban says so. One, one king wants to kill you, I will make sure another king arrives and he will be Merachem on you. That's how we're sitting here today in Yerushalayim. Yeah,